we're trying to understand how the splitting field of a polynomial can give us a measurement of just how difficult it is to locate the roots of that polynomial. For example, we've already taken a look at the polynomial t cubed minus 2, which is irreducible over the rationals, and asked the question, what do we need to do, what do we need to add to the rationals in order to locate all three of the roots of this cubic polynomial? And what we found what is it actually requires a two-step process. First, we have to include the real cubed root of 2, the one that you would get if you asked a calculator what is a solution to t cubed minus 2. But that only gives you one out of the three roots, and the other two have to be found by extending one more time to include the third root of unity, which is a non-real number. And so in order to find the splitting field of this polynomial, we had to take two steps. And at each one of those steps, we only got one additional root. 2 to the 1 third in this case, and then 2 to the 1 third times the third root of unity in the second case. But of course, as soon as we get n minus 1 of the roots, we'll also get the nth, the last one. So this was kind of a stubborn polynomial, because it took us both of those steps in order to construct its splitting field. And at each step, we got a minimal number of additional roots in that extended field. On the other hand, last year in a seminar, I looked at a polynomial t cubed minus 3t minus 1 also a cubic polynomial. But in that seminar, which if you're looking on a PC, you can access just by clicking here. In that seminar, I looked at how to construct the splitting field of that polynomial and found out that it only took one step. We'll see in this video, at a quick recap, why as soon as we have one of the roots of this polynomial, that we magically also get the other two. And so constructing the splitting field of this cubic only takes one step. So that's the comparison that we want to make here that some polynomials, like t cubed minus 2, we have to do a lot of work in order to find all of the roots. Some polynomials require less work. And so somehow the splitting field, the field where we find all of the roots of that polynomial, is a measurement of the complexity of that polynomial. How much work do we have to do in order to locate all of its roots? And this is our first step along the way to the Galois correspondence, which is going to tell us how the automorphism group of a splitting field of a polynomial gives us information about the roots of that polynomial. In what sense does an automorphism group measure the complexity of a polynomial? So how big of a tower do we have to build in order to split a polynomial? In other words, find all of its roots. So if we have a long tower, in other words, if we have to extend a lot of times, it's because each of the roots that we locate is coming by itself. It's not bringing conjugate friends with it automatically. So for t cubed minus 2, um, we'll find out that this has the largest possible Galois group, in other words, the most number of automorphisms of its splitting field, among any cubic polynomial, polynomial of degree 3. So if we start from the rationals, in which t cubed minus 2 has no roots because it's irreducible, and then we extend by the real cube root of 2, what we get is a partial factorization of t cubed minus 2. Because we have one root, we can split off a factor of t minus that root, so t minus 2 to the 1 third. But that quadratic that remains is irreducible, and so in order to split it, we also have to adjoin the cube root of unity, zeta 3. When we do that, now we can split the entire polynomial. But we needed both of those steps in order to locate all those roots. And in this example, that first step was a degree 3 extension. The second step was a degree 2 extension. And therefore, the total extension is degree 6. And since we've arrived at the splitting field of this polynomial, Splitting fields are always normal extensions, and therefore, by the normal extension theorem that we saw previously, there will be exactly as many automorphisms of this splitting field as the degree of that extension. So since the total degree is 6, that means that there are 6 automorphisms of this splitting field over q. And that is the largest number of automorphisms that we can have, because every automorphism group of an nth degree polynomial will be a subgroup, isomorphic to a subgroup, of the symmetric group on n symbols because every automorphism of the splitting field will induce a permutation of the roots of this polynomial, of which there are n. So the Galois group of this polynomial must be all of S3. And that happened, so we got that largest possible Galois group, because at each of the levels of this tower, we only get one additional root at a time. None of the roots arrive with their conjugates, with the exception of the one that must, namely the last extension, which splits our irreducible quadratic into two linear factors. And we know by the conjugate roots theorem for quadratics that quadratic roots will always come along with their conjugates. But every other step of the game, we're only getting one root at a time. 
And so this was a really stubborn polynomial to construct a splitting field for. By contrast, t cubed minus 3t minus 1, we'll find out, actually takes less work to do. Well, it takes less work to locate its roots, but it does take quite a bit of work to prove that all those roots are where we claim that they are. Now we can show that t cubed minus 3t minus 1 is irreducible over q, um, merely using the rational roots theorem. After all, cubics are irreducible if and only if they have uh, no roots in the base field. So because this polynomial doesn't have a rational root, it's irreducible over q. But it is cubic. And by calculus, using the intermediate value theorem, we can show that every cubic, and in particular any polynomial of an odd degree, will always have at least one root that is real. So let's call alpha a real root of this polynomial. Since it's cubic, it has to have at least one real root. It has to cross, its graph has to cross the x-axis, basically. And so if we make this extension, then it's going to be an extension of degree 3 because its minimal polynomial will be p. So we can factor a t minus alpha out of it. Now the question is, when we factor t minus alpha out of it, what remains? What is this quadratic that's left over? To find out what it is, we can make the coefficients of that quadratic a and b and make it monic because our original polynomial was monic. And then let's just find out what a and b are by multiplying this back out and then equating its coefficients with that of t cubed minus 3t minus 1. That's going to give us a minus alpha is equal to 0, b minus alpha a is equal to negative 3, and negative b times alpha is equal to negative 1. This is a linear system of equations whose coefficients are in q adjoint alpha that can tell us what a and b are, except that a and b are two unknowns and we have three equations. So we should be sure to make sure that this is a consistent system. In general, it might not be. The first equation tells us that a has to equal alpha, so that's pretty nice. And substituting that into our second equation, we get b minus alpha squared is equal to negative 3. Therefore, b is equal to negative 3 plus alpha squared. But the last equation tells us b also has to be equal to 1 over alpha. And so this is only going to be a consistent linear system if those two right-hand sides, both of which are supposed to be equal to b, are equal to one another. So is it true that negative 3 plus alpha squared is equal to 1 over alpha? And the answer is yes, precisely because alpha is the root of t cubed minus 3t minus 1. So multiplying through by alpha and then moving the 1 to the other side, we find out that alpha satisfies this equation precisely because we defined it to be a root of this p. So that makes this a consistent system of equations. And we can therefore write this quadratic factor as t squared plus alpha t plus 1 over alpha. Now the question is, once we adjoin that alpha, so once we go to this field, do we have all of the roots of this polynomial of p? We will have all of the roots if and only if this quadratic that we have left over here is reducible, if and only if it factors. And because quadratics are quadratics, and we have the quadratic formula, we know that the roots of that quadratic will belong to q adjoint alpha precisely if b squared minus 4ac, that thing underneath the radical in the quadratic formula, is a perfect square in the field q adjoint alpha. And this is where we're going to do most of our work for this problem. We need to determine whether alpha squared minus 4 times 1 over alpha is a perfect square, not a perfect square of a rational number, but a perfect square of a number in q adjoin alpha, which is really a quotient ring, a quotient field, right? q adjoin t, quotiented out by t cubed minus 3t minus 1. So we have to figure out whether or not alpha squared minus 4 alpha to the minus 1 is a perfect square keeping in mind that alpha is a root of this polynomial. So therefore, alpha cubed minus 3 alpha is going to be equal to 1. Dividing through by alpha, we get alpha squared minus 3 equal to alpha inverse. So we'll just replace alpha inverse by alpha squared minus 3 and simplify that to get negative 3 alpha squared plus 12. So this is the simplest way for us to write this b squared minus 4ac, this discriminant-like factor. Um, and now we want to find out if negative 3 alpha squared plus 12 is actually a perfect square of some element in q adjoint alpha. Elements of q adjoint alpha we can write as a plus b alpha plus c alpha squared. So I want to know if one of those squared can equal negative 3 alpha squared plus 12. To find out, let's just square that arbitrary element. When I do that, I get a squared plus 2ab times alpha plus 2ac plus b squared alpha squared plus 2bc alpha cubed plus alpha to the fourth just collecting all of our terms. But now is when we have to remember that alpha satisfies an equation of degree 3. Therefore, we can rewrite any power of alpha, which is the third power or higher, in terms of lower order powers of alpha. So alpha cubed, for example, we can rewrite as 3 alpha plus 1. 
Therefore, alpha to the fourth, we can write as alpha times three alpha plus one. When I rewrite those powers, now we're doing arithmetic in the quotient. Q would join t modulo t cubed minus three t minus one. That lets me recollect all of my coefficients in terms of just one alpha and alpha squared and get this combination of coefficients. Now I want to know whether I can make that equal to negative three alpha squared plus 12. So again, equating the coefficients, we get this system. 2bc plus a squared, our constant, has to equal 12. c squared plus 6bc plus 2ab, our linear term, has to have a zero coefficient. And 3c squared plus 2ac plus b squared, which is our alpha squared coefficient, has to be negative 3. So now I have another system of equations. The problem is this one is nonlinear. So in general, it's going to be a little trickier to solve. I'll be completely honest, I gave up and asked Mathematica if this had a solution. Mathematica actually gave me a whole bunch of different solutions, but all of those should be equivalent. So I'll pick the simplest one that it gave me, which is a equals 4, b equals 1, and c equals negative 2. Therefore, there does exist an element in q adjoint alpha whose square is equal to negative 3 alpha squared plus 12. Therefore, the discriminant of this quadratic is in fact a perfect square, so the quadratic can be factored. In other words, the quadratic's roots are also in q adjoint alpha. And by the quadratic formula, those roots are going to be exactly negative b plus or minus delta all over 2 alpha. And then putting the players into their places, we get negative alpha plus or minus 4 plus alpha minus 2 alpha squared all divided by 2. If I take the plus sign, I get the root 2 minus alpha squared. If I take the minus, I get negative 2 minus alpha plus alpha squared. So lo and behold, after all of that work, what we have, what we win, is a description of all three of the roots of this cubic polynomial written in terms of only one of them. And they all belong to the same extended field q adjoin alpha. So when we adjoin alpha, when we adjoin even only one root of this p, we magically also get the second and the third. So we don't have to build as large of a tower to locate the roots of p for this polynomial as we did for the polynomial on the right. So this was a much friendlier polynomial. It has a smaller Galois group. In particular, because q adjoin alpha is the splitting field of our polynomial now, it must be a normal extension of q. And therefore, the number of automorphisms that it has is going to be equal to its degree. And its degree is 3. Therefore, there are only three automorphisms of q adjoin alpha over q. And therefore, its automorphism group is going to have order 3 instead of 6. So again, this happened because it was very easy to split this polynomial. As soon as we adjoin one root, alpha, we automatically get the second and the third without having to do any additional extending. Therefore, the Galois group of this polynomial is isomorphic to z mod 3, the only group that has order 3. So in this way, we can see how the Galois group is a measurement of how stubborn a polynomial is to split. In other words, how many times we have to extend in order to find the roots of that polynomial. For the one on the right, we had to extend a maximal number of times, and we got the largest possible Galois group for a cubic, S3. For the polynomial on the left, we only had to extend once, and we got a smaller Galois group that was only an index 2 subgroup of S3, namely Z mod 3. What we want to do next is understand how this correspondence works in more generality. How do we associate fields with groups, specifically intermediate fields of an extension, with subgroups of an automorphism group? That's the Galois correspondence. And once we have that, we are a hair's breadth away from understanding why the quadratic, cubic, and quartic cases are so different from the case of polynomials with degree 5.